is that the bill be now read a second time. As may as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes, the ayes have it. Public Procurement British Goods and Services Bill, second reading. Now. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that the bill now be now read a second time. I am delighted <coughs> to bring this bill to the House today. My Public Procurement British Goods and Services Bill is an important but focused bill. It will make minor amendments to both the Public Services Social Value Act 2012 and the Procurement Act 2023 to encourage greater uptake of British products in UK government contracts. The bill aims to increase transparency and raise the importance of the origin of goods and services, animal welfare standards, environmental impact and the standard of employment in procurement decisions. It achieves this by requiring the contracting body to publish their data demonstrating how these areas are met in the contracts awarded. In 2014, my 10-minute rule bill on publishing the gender pay gap for organisations employing more than 250 staff made a similar obligation. First blocked, then adopted by the government, it has revolutionised transparency and indeed equality within those businesses. So I do hope the, business, the government will be similarly pragmatic when it comes to this bill and gives it a safe passage. Hear, hear. Every year, the UK government spends over £300 billion on public procurement, which accounts for almost a third of all public expenditure. However, despite this huge figure, the Spend Network's analysis found that big corporations win 90% of the contracts that are deemed suitable for small and medium-sized <coughs> businesses, SMEs. As a result, SMEs are missing out on around 30 billion worth of public contracts annually. That's £30 billion worth that could be going to British businesses. SMEs are the beating heart of our economy, accounting for 99% of businesses in the UK and 61% of employment, which equates to 16.7 million jobs. It's therefore shocking that they are consistently missing out on so many suitable public procurement contracts. In addition, a worrying number of contracts are awarded to foreign suppliers. Research from Tussle found that in 2020 alone, the public sector spent £18 billion with overseas suppliers rather than supporting their UK counterparts. The Public Accounts Committee report, Competition in Public Procurement, published in December, concluded that the government, and I quote, has not demonstrated that it has consistently used its purchasing power to support national and local policies and objectives, or to drive healthy and competitive markets, including buying from SMEs. It also found that the government has, I quote, not been fully capturing data on procurement, much less using, it, using the analytics from collected data to draw insights on how competition in public procurement is operating within government and give context to purchasing decisions. This has to change, and my bill can do that. The Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, in its report, Public Sector Procurement of Food from April 2021, rightly stated that public procurement, I quote, has the potential <coughs> to create significant business and growth opportunities through increased participation for small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as improving the public sector's success, access to SMEs' creativity and innovation. However, it crucially noted that SMEs have long faced difficulties in accessing public procurement opportunities. Of course they will. Here, here. I'm very grateful, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the Honourable Lady is making a very good case. I think she knows that the Government has quite a lot of common ground with her policy intent. Uh, she may know that officials in the Cabinet Office are preparing for a new national procurement policy statement to set out the Government's strategic priorities in relation to procurement. Can I offer the Honourable Lady and her task group an opportunity to meet with the Minister Oh, and perhaps first with officials, and then if necessary with the Minister, and um, also uh, uh, my honourable friend for Colchester in relation to food. I'd be very grateful if she'd take up that opportunity because we would like her exper expertise and that of the group. 
I think she knows that because we've only recently legislated, it's very difficult for the government to support her bill. So I, I hope she'll take up the op offer of that meeting. Um, the, the Minister, as ever, is trying to find a, a, a solution um, which benefits us both, and that's what I'm trying to do with my bill. So I absolutely take up his offer. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll talk more about the working group at the end, but, um, but, but I have brought together a group of industry professionals. We all want to see British businesses getting a fair slice of what is a 300 billion pie, because we want our businesses to flourish in this country. So I really thank the offer for that. Um, uh, I really thank the officer, the, the minister, for that offer. Apologies. I've been sat there a long time, minister. <laughs> um, <coughs> finally, one more select committee report uh, from the Defence Select Committee in July 2023. Uh, it simply stated that the UK defence procurement system is broke and that it's time to fix it. So I welcome the Minister's offer. To tackle these long recognised issues within the UK pro government procurement system, my bill aims to back British businesses for public contracts, champion the UK's world-class manufacturing and food production, increase the visibility of British food procured by the public sector, encourage investment and jobs created in towns and cities across the country, improve transparency around contracts awarded to SMEs, and, just as importantly, recognise and reward good employment practices. Let me give some context to demonstrate the need right now for this bill. The UK is in a recession, and it has experienced years of stagnant economic growth. The number of companies going bust in 2023 hit a 30-year high. More than 25,000 UK company insolvencies were registered last year. And these figures show that one in 186 active firms went bust in 2023. This grim economic outlook is compounded by the fact that many SMEs feel shut out of the public procurement system. Taxpayers' money is being spent with big multinationals and foreign suppliers when as much as possible should be spent on supporting British businesses and jobs, as other countries do with their own industries. The Government has long argued that e the EU had rules preventing them from prioritising British businesses. Many saw Brexit as an opportunity for more taxpayers' money to be spent with British suppliers. We were told that British businesses would be first in the queue for UK government contracts once we left the EU. The 2019 Conservative Party manifesto even stated with regard to food procurement that when we leave the EU, we will be able to encourage the public sector to buy British to support our farmers and reduce environmental cost. This has simply not happened. Now is high time for some of the benefits <coughs> voters were promised from Brexit to actually come to pass. My bill, if the government accepts it, will deliver more contracts to British businesses. And this isn't a new issue. Since my election in, 2020, in 2012, I have been continuously highlighting how the UK government needs to do more to support <coughs> British steelmakers through public procurement. The UK steel industry <coughs> employs almost 40,000 people directly, with another 50,000 jobs supported through the supply chain. It also directly contributes $2.9 billion to the UK economy and adds $3.8 billion indirectly through supply chains. My constituency of Rotherham is a hub for steel production. We're incredibly proud of that heritage. <coughs> Liberty Steel employs 900 people locally and supports the employment of many more workers throughout <coughs> the steel chain. We make unique, speciality green steel, much valued around the world, especially in aerospace. Despite the expertise and high quality steel that Liberty and other steel makers produce, our steel industry still needs government support. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about handouts, I'm talking about public mm. contracts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. UK steel analysis of the 2023 steel pipeline report found that of the total £603 million worth of steel procured by government in the last financial year, 2022-23, only £365 million was UK produced. Furthermore, the British Construction Steel Association analysis of steel used in the HS2 project 
found that only 58% of steel contracts were awarded to British suppliers. This is despite the UK steel industry having the capacity to have carried out 100% of the work. I welcome the recent introduction of UK steel safeguards and that UK government departments are now required to report past buying and future purchase pipelines of UK-made steel bought by the public first. These measures, particularly the reporting of where the steel is procured from in projects, are designed to encourage the uptake of UK-produced steel. The mandatory reporting model is a good template for other industries and other departments, and I really welcome it. My bill takes this mechanism and seeks to use it to achieve similar results across the economy, compelling contracting authorities to publish where they are procuring from and to encourage the uptake of goods and services from British suppliers. Let me give another example. I'm sure honourable members are aware that of the, British, the public procurement system is failing our great British farmers. I strongly believe that we must support our local food producers by ensuring that we buy, sell, make and grow more of our food, entrenching Britain's reputation as a beacon for quality food, high standards and ethical animal treatment. The UK public sector spends around 2.4 billion a year procuring food for organisations such as schools and hospitals and indeed the armed forces. This accounts for approximately 5.5% of UK food sector sales. Despite this level of spending, there is no accurate measure of how much food the public sector procures from British farmers. Okay. My bill will address this. Mr Deputy Speaker, the British public supports buying British. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. online supermarket Okodo reported that 87% of its customers considered it important to support British farmers, with searches for British produce on its web website up 77% year on year. I will, of course... I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady giving way, and she conveniently um, mentions the addition of the Buy British button on Ocado. Would she pay tribute to my Honourable Friend, the Member for Bosworth, who led a fantastic campaign yeah, yeah. bringing in that Buy British button on a number of supermarket websites and would she join my call for all of the others to catch up and do the same? Um, my Honourable Friend has a premonition. That was literally my next line. <laughs> <laughs> the Honourable Member for Bosworth has, should indeed be commended for the Buy British button <coughs> and absolutely we should roll that out across all websites, across all suppliers. Every supermarket, every local shop should be proud to say that they stock produce that was made as locally as possible, but British if not. It helps us on so many levels, particularly the environmental, but it supports our workers who are doing an amazing job in a very, very tough environment. So I absolutely support him and his colleague for the work that they are do have done and are doing around this. Will she give way? Of course I will give way. But as she points out, quite rightly, schools and hospitals where you don't have a choice of what provider you can go to because you are, by the very nature, in an institution, just like here, don't have that choice because the choice is made by the institution on their behalf. Surely this is the importance of her bill so that that is reported and we push to ensure that where consumers can't have a choice, the choice on their behalf is the right choice. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the point that's raised and, and I don't think that anybody procuring with taxpayers' money wants to do a bad job, wants to waste money, uh, isn't, isn't procuring at the, the, the highest uh, scrutiny that they can possibly impose. What my bill is trying to do is ask them to publish what are the decisions that they're making and hopefully if future ministers then follow up that data they can see why decisions are made and how much of that is going to British suppliers. Yeah. Yeah. I also think, in his specific example, that parents would love to know mm -hmm. the, the, the trail of food that their, their children are eating. Yeah. Yeah. And that's backed up by a recent poll by Delta Poll, found that 81% of 4,000 people polled said being able to buy British food was very or fairly important whilst 94% of people said support of farmers was very or fairly important. Despite overwhelming public and cross-party support for buying British, let's be honest, our farmers are struggling. 
The Office of National Statistics reported that over 6,000 agricultural businesses have closed since 2027, so, sorry, 2017. Meanwhile, the NFU report that businesses, <coughs> business certainty and confidence within British farming is at an all-time low. Alongside the obvious economic and social benefits of buying more British food, such as boosting the economy and creating jobs, there's also ethical reasons for wanting more British food to be procured. The RSPCA has long raised the issue of procuring authorities buying food from overseas that's actually produced to lower standards than in the UK, such as battery eggs and sow stall pork. In the UK, we lead the world in our animal welfare standards. Through my bill focusing on buying British, we will also be contributing to cruelty-free procurement becoming the norm. My bill will require contracting authorities to publish what proportion of food procured originates from suppliers in the UK. This will finally create an accurate measure of how much food the public sector produces, procures from British farmers. I will. The Honourable Lady for giving where she's been incredibly generous with her time. I had the privilege of sitting on the Procurement Bill Committee recently, and that was a, a, a lengthy piece of legislation dealing with a whole panoply of procurement legislation to make our procurement system fit for the future. I wonder if she could just give some remarks to the House as to why it's important for her bill to progress today when we haven't yet had the results of that bill coming into force and seeing the results of that work that was done. Thank you, and thank you for the work you and my honourable friend did on that very important bill. Um, what I'm trying to do is aid the process of that rollout, because what I'm saying is, if my bill passes, that the procuring authorities will have to publish what it is they're procuring. So that will be the, probably the only data available to see if the intention, which was a cross-party intention to try and get more British businesses supporting through our procurement, this will probably be the only data set you have that will be able to see if the rollout of that bill is working. If it isn't, it would then give the ministers the information to actually be more bold in the guidance that will follow, hopefully, or the updated guidance, to show it is ministers' wish that more of that procuring money if able, if it's not breaching any laws, is going to those very same businesses. So, so I, I only see it as a help. I do not in any way see it undermining what's happening. Or in either way. And I've answered my next paragraph, so thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, the Honourable Member, there's something going on here. <laughs> um, importantly, this bill does not require public procurement professionals to take any specific action beyond reporting. Of what's, been, of what's been procured and how it benefits its local environment. Such an obligation cannot reasonably be seen as compromising the UK's international obligations, which I know is a concern that the UK government previously had with Buy British policies. This measure will benefit UK food producers on the principle that what is inspected is generally delivered. And I'm proud that the NFU, Countryside Alliance, and the RSPCA all help me develop this bill and support it. It also feels like the government, uh, and particularly the minister, supports it. And so I do welcome the recent announcement of an independent advisor, the Honourable Member for Colchester, to support their ongoing work to improve the public sector food procurement. The areas of the review are strikingly close to those I seek to address with this bill. So let me say to the Minister that I am incredibly grateful that he has offered uh, the Honourable Member's time and hopefully the civil servant's time so that we can work together for those common aims. Thank you. I now turn to another key driver behind this bill, which is enabling SMEs to access public contracts. As I said, SMEs make up 99% of UK businesses and account for 61% of employment. Despite being the beating heart of our economy, research from the Federation of Small Businesses have found that SMEs are effectively shut out of public procurement systems. Only one in five SMEs have bid for a public sector contract in the last three years. In the construction industry, a sector heavily reliant on SMEs, only two in five SMEs have bid for a public sector contract in the last three years. 
SMEs need <coughs> public sector opportunities, that is with experience of between one and nine bids. 49% of them have failed to secure a single contract <coughs> in the last three years. The lack of transparency means they don't know why they failed. Submitting a tendering application is resource heavy. If you keep getting back, knocked back, you eventually stop trying. And the stats show that's exactly yeah. what's happening. Yeah. The National Federation of Builders, a trade association representing the interests of small and medium-sized house builders, told me that one of their members had not successfully bid for a public sector contract for over a decade, even though they were well qualified to deliver. Sadly, this situation is replicated across most sectors. Of course, some SMEs will be rejected for good reasons, but there is clearly a cultural issue around public contracts being awarded to large, often multinational businesses well, over we'll SMEs. I will, of course, give way. I thank you for giving way. And, and quite often, smaller companies are put off because the actual cost of actually tendering for those contracts are so high that if they fail to win them, then it could have a really detrimental impact on their business as a whole. My honourable friend is absolutely right. And, and it's that chilling factor that, that is having a real negative impact on the whole of our SMEs. And there are ways, we, we debated it as part of the, um, the working group, of uh, dividing bigger contracts down so that local SMEs are, are more inclined to go for them. But unless they know why they fail, unless they know that the door is actually open to them, why would they waste the precious resources that they have on bidding for something which they see as utterly futile? And that's what we have to change. There is clearly a cultural issue, as I said, and this is demonstrated in the fact that 90% of contracts deemed suitable for SMEs are awarded to corporate, large corporations. Data from the British Chamber of Commerce <coughs> found that in 2016, 25% of public sector procurement spending was awarded directly to SMEs. As of 2021, this figure had dropped to 21%. That's only just over one in every five pounds spent by the UK government on public services going straight to SMEs. This is in stark contrast to the UK government's own 2022 target of spending one in every three pounds with SMEs. The national chair of the Federation of Small Business said in August 23, I quote, meeting procurement targets isn't just a bureaucratic milestone. It's an affirmation of trust in our small business community. He's right. FMEs offer so much expertise and innovation and must be awarded more suitable public contracts. Frustratingly, when they do get a bite of the cherry, it's usually as a subcontractor, at a much lower remuneration than if they had been the lead, and of course, without the public credit. And it's an example of that that led me to bring this bill forward. A Rotherham business, an innovation business, leading not only the UK but the world in its innovation, was very grateful for a one million contract from government to deliver. However, it found out that it was actually a £10 million contract that had been delivered to a multinational who then subcontracted it down oh, to shopping. my business and they did nothing other than the packaging and the marketing around yeah. it. So had oh. my business known that they could have applied, yeah. even if they got £2 million, that would have meant that they didn't have to do it just for cost for what they hoped would be a way into government procurement. They could have done it and made a profit and continued. And at the moment, they're facing it a really tough, tough time. By amending section 1.3 of the Public Sector Social Value Act 2012, my bill seeks to add an obligation for contracting authorities to consider how procurement from small and medium-sized enterprises might improve the well-being in their area. Section 2 of the Bill will require contracting authorities to report how they have complied with this obligation. It's hoped that these changes will increase the importance of SMEs within social value tenders and encourage the public sector to award more contracts to them. As I mentioned, billions of pounds of public contracts are awarded to foreign suppliers every year. The most recent data shows that a substantial number of contracts are awarded to foreign suppliers both directly and indirectly. Indirectly being when a foreign supplier controls the successful applicant for a contract. 
of public contracts valued below 200 million, 2.3% were awarded directly to foreign suppliers. However, this number rose to 17.6% when indirect awards are accounted for. This story is similarly similar for contracted values over 200 million. 2.1% were directly awarded to foreign suppliers, whereas 31.5% of contracts were indirectly awarded to foreign suppliers. An example of such a contract is a <coughs> 1.6 billion Royal Navy contract awarded to a Spanish-led consortium in 2022 over an all-British one. Analysis shows that at least 40% of the work worth 64 million will go abroad and be carried out in Spain. To compound this issue, there have been no concrete answers as to whether there is a limit on how many jobs will be created in Spain and why there are no targets for UK steel in the contract. Do my honourable friend give way? I will give way. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for uh, making uh, such significant points and poignant points, really. And uh, I'm sure uh, she's had much thought, given much thought to this. Um, could she therefore say, what does, why is it that the government has therefore put, um, allowed so many procurements to foreign suppliers uh, over British SMEs? What's her thoughts on this? <sighs> um, <laughs> my honourable friend asked an impossible question, and she might want to ask it again to the minister. Mm. Um, I, I, I think there. So in developing this bill, I've had conversations with the minister, um, and he's been very open. I know uh, the, the minister who's due to reply is also very open to this. I actually think the block is hesitancy when it comes to the legislation and finding a way through, which is why my bill is terribly modest in that it's just looking at getting transparency around where those contracts go with the hope that that will do enough to influence where they actually land, and hopefully one expects with British businesses. So who knows? So who knows? Um, and I have to say, it's a question the British public is asking all the time, particularly when their local business goes bust as a consequence of it. So going back to this contract, the £1.6 billion contract, the all-British bid would have generated over <coughs> 6,000 good UK jobs and supported a full onshore build of the ships. This bid also promised an investment of 90 million in UK shipyards and a further 54 million in training, apprenticeships and improving UK skills base. Had social value to the UK be prioritised, as my bill would encourage, surely it would have won the contract. Instead, a sizeable proportion will go abroad at the expense of British jobs and supporting British businesses. My bill raises the level of importance attached to the origin of goods and services in procurement decisions by increasing transparency around how public sector contracts are awarded and encouraging the uptake of British originating products. My bill also seeks to highlight good employment standards within procurement. When developing the bill, the TUC shared with me the dire state of employment standards and working practices within public procurement. Mm -hmm. To be clear, most employers treat their employees well, but it is common for outsourcing to have a detrimental effect on wages and conditions, with outsourced workers more likely to work longer hours, receive less pay, or be on insecure or temporary contracts. Will she give way? I will, of course, give way. Is it not also a particular problem when you, of course, uh, give a procurement to a foreign company who will be using workers that are based on different standards, different collective bargaining, and it is totally unfair to the British businesses that have to follow British laws and British agreements with trade unions, and actually providing this data will provide a level playing field also to those businesses who know where they're being undercut. Um, my honourable friend, again, is absolutely right. And, and, of course, if you pay people appallingly, mm -hmm. you, you can then undercut British businesses mm -hmm. that want to pay people well, yeah. that want to give them the terms and conditions <coughs> so that work is fulfilling both economically as well as psychologically for them. So, yes, we, we, we're losing hand over fist with the current situation. My bill would therefore require contracting authorities to consider how it might act to support good employment standards and working practices. 
My bill defines good employment standards and working practices as including, but not limited to, yeah. compliance with national and international obligations in the fields of environment, social and labour law mm -hmm. and collective agreements. The bill also requires contracting authorities to include reasonable details about how it has complied with its obligations to meet these standards in a contract award notice. My amendments to existing legislation raise the importance of good work within public procurement and encourage contracting authorities to award contracts to good employers by attempting to replicate Clause 56 of the Public Contracts Regulation 2015. This clause related to excluding suppliers who are not compliant with international and domestic social labour and environmental laws. And it's designed to stop bad employment practices being tolerated within public procurement, such as fire and rehire, and contractors refusing to implement the annual uplift of the real living wage. Great care has been taken in drafting the bill to, to avoid including measures that would threaten the UK's international obligations with respect to trade rules and the agreement on government procurement. It is also important to note that my bill would place the responsibility on the contracting authorities, not the suppliers or UK government, to publish data on their compliance with the relevant causes within Section 2 of the bill. Minister, I hope my bill will also influence the current conversation around reforming the public procurement system. And so I am very grateful that the Minister has offered for uh, myself and the working group to meet with the civil servants and maybe the Minister uh, to make changes, if needed, to the National Procurement Policy <coughs> Statement. Because published in June 2021, the NPPS argued that the huge power of public procurement expenditure I quote, must support the delivery of public sector policy priorities, including generating economic growth, helping our communities recover from COVID-19 pandemic, and supporting the transition to net zero carbon. It goes on to outline how public procurement should be leveraged to support priority national and local outcomes for the public benefit, and that contracting authorities should consider social value outcomes when procuring such goods and services. My bill seeks to cover all of those, but I would be a little stronger on the should to a must. Um, aside from that, I think we're absolutely on the same page of this. To conclude, my conversations with Rotherham businesses and national industry groups have made it clear that the changes I am proposing are welcome and overdue. I defy the Minister to find anyone in the UK who would not see this as common sense. Implementing them will increase transparency and encourage more public contracts to be awarded to British suppliers. By supporting this bill, the House has an opportunity to demonstrate their support to British manufacturers, builders, farmers and SMEs. I would also like to thank the Labour front bench for their support of this bill. And I'm very grateful to the members of the working group who helped me develop it. The TUC, UK Steel, National Farmers Union, RSPCA, YPO, Countryside Alliance, APSI, Bloom Procurement Services, the National Federation of Builders and Jonathan Davey for all the help, support and guidance they have given me with this bill to date. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Questions that bill be round read a second time. Peter Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Rotherham for bringing forward her bill which flies the flag for British business. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm a firm believer in supporting businesses and ensuring that we do all that we can to embrace, support and expand British business. Indeed, on the topic of buying British business, as I mentioned earlier in my earlier intervention, uh, my honourable friend, the member for Bosworth, has uh, done some fantastic work in encouraging our supermarkets to add a Buy British button to many uh, supermarket websites, and he needs to be commended for that fantastic work. Um, I, I think the Honourable Lady's bill um, brings forward uh, some important points and some important focus on British businesses and, and it's important that we do indeed focus on British businesses. We do need to be flexible in our procurement processes but I think that we need more focus on ensuring that small and medium small and medium enterprises 
do have that chance to succeed and not be discriminated against. And whilst I, I admire the Honourable Lady's intentions and I'm not disagreeable to them in themselves, I think with the work that's already been done in respect of the procurement bill this year, um, I think we need to see that proceed and progress before I can support her bill. Thank you. Lloyd Russell Moore. Thank you very much, uh, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, and it is a pleasure to follow my honourable friend from Rotherham, who has laid out a very good reason why we need to um, uh, develop these uh, uh, measurements. Um, and it was a pleasure to serve with the um, honourable member for Darlington on the public procurement bill uh, in the last session, where we, um, on this side of the House, put forward a number of amendments that would have tried to further the cause of making sure that we evaluate social value in contracts. And whether something is British is clearly a key social value to contracts. British contracts pay back taxpayers' money, returns back to local economies. We see that the exchequer advantages, but also you tend to have higher and better quality of standards um, in terms of workers' rights and in terms of environmental rights. There is, in my view, a real problem with the current process where we um, introduce standards, be it environmental standards, be it, um, be it uh, workers' standards, that quite rightly we demand are high. And then we say to companies, but don't worry, get around it. Yes. Ignore all of it, just offshore your production. And in fact, those standards become a great champion of not actually increasing standards, <coughs> but destroying jobs yep. in yep. this country. Yep. Yep. Now, some people from the other side, not, not all, but some on the other side would say, well, that's an example of why we need to deregulate. Mm. They would say that's an example why we should in, embrace our Brexit freedoms to ensure that we um, never get to a place where, um, where we are com uh, anti-competitive around the rest of the world. The problem is that is a race to the very bottom because, OK, it's first of all a race against below EU standards and then it's a race against standards from Turkey and then it's a race against standards of China or countries in Africa and in the end we end up with our people and our population poorer yep. and our environment more degraded. Yep. That is why, of course, the European Union and the US have implemented carbon border adjustments so that when we put standards on uh, environmental standards, uh, we ensure, and they ensure, that there is a tax put on to make the adjustment of the saving that the company will make by offshoring. Now, whilst the government, quite rightly, has moved towards adopting latterly, I'm afraid, some of the carbon border adjustments, they have not gone far enough. And we have seen in both America and now Europe an understanding that the open procurement, where we ignore the conditions of the bidding companies, is a road to ruin. We have seen how they have introduced acts to focus on buying American or buying European. And we've seen, despite the naysayers, how it has not led to those countries ending up being hauled up in the World Trade Organization on the general agreement around um, public procurement, which of course we are a signatory to. But the fact that other countries that are signatories to it are able to implement by their own country um, priorities shows to me that we should be less concerned about that and more concerned about British jobs, British workers and British companies. <laughs> now, I have a small um, organisation in my constituency who, in the public procurement, in the, in the bill that came forward, we tried to put forward an amendment for. And it would mean that the non-profit and small organisations could be given a foot up in public procurement. It could mean that if a contracting party has already developed a local relationship with those organisations, they could bypass certain levels of public procurement. 
Now that, I'm afraid, was rejected by the front bench. But in Brighton we have a real example of why it is needed. Only a few years ago, RISE, which is Brighton's specialist domestic violence service, one of 180 members of the network of women aids aid organisation providing local expert safe holistic services for women and children and LGBT survivors of domestic abuse were defunded when they lost their public procurement bid to a national and international consortium they were set up by almost 50 they were set up 50 years ago they were registered charity 30 years ago, and they argued and successfully got the first all-women's refuge in Brighton. 16 years ago, they set up the first LGBT service for domestic abuse survivors in the country. And three years ago, they, were, they lost their public procurement. And they have had to build from scratch. And the reality is, the procurement that was done didn't take into account the correct social value. It didn't take into account where the terms and conditions negotiated through trade unions would be, um, would be, uh, would be included. And it has led to large numbers of people not having the service that they would expect. And surprise, surprise, the contractors that took the service to run the Women's Refuge a housing association, a nice, very good housing association, but not a women's-led specialist organisation in this area, what happened? They weren't able to offer the wraparound services. And the council had to provide additional emergency funds to RISE to go into those refuges and provide the wraparound services that those women have needed. A procurement process that defunded a local women's-led organisation that then cost the council more because they had to provide additional funding to the women's-led organisations. It is a loss on women for women in my city. It is a loss for the council that has had to pay more money in my city. And it's all because there is not a proper framework for the council to evaluate and ensure that rather than us just having this neoliberal public procurement blind process. We work with communities, we nurture communities, and what will be the end result? Because next time round, when the procurement comes around, RISE, which was a healthy and strong organisation, will be, I'm afraid, a weak and diminished organisation. Will they be able to competitively bid against a national or international person uh, who, is, who is bidding for it? No. So in the end, there are less providers in this space. And of course, with monopoly providers, we all know how the market works, if we did our basic GCSE or O-level economics like I did, is that the price that will then be bid for will be higher. It will mean that there will be less um, uh, uh, options for councils to go for. It will mean the taxpayer loses out. And I think that that is something that we need to start turning around. But unfortunately, what has happened by the loss of this bigger bid for RISE is that in the current cuts that we are being forced to implement in Brighton and Hove by the continued austerity and the failure to support local councils, is that this year they have been not able to bid for £129,000 of additional services. That is the £5,000 for the third sector grant, the £99,000 for the new burdens LGBT dispersed refuge, meaning that we will have no specialist LGBT refuge support in the city. That will put pressure on the women's refuge, which of course we have maintained decent, good, separate services, separate but equal services, that's how it should be, but now that will be at threat, and the threat of the um, therapeutic wellbeing service for women and children. And in these uncertain times, if we had started that process differently, we would have ended up instead with a flourishing um, local community. In December, the committee that I sit on, <coughs> the um, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, produced a report, and we found that the government has not demonstrated that it has constantly used its purchasing power to support local and national policies. In fact, 
it was referenced by my honourable friend but early on. But the big problem that we found is that there is no data. Without data, you can't provide policy. And without policy, you can't correct the problem that we see happening all around us. We see local communities losing out all around, but we are not able to get the, um, uh, the, the, the data that's needed. In fact, a number of our international agreements that we have signed, uh, the international agreements uh, with the Australia trade deal, had revolutionary clauses around gender, for example. But if we are not monitoring some of these other issues, we will not be able to put clauses in future trade deals either, and we will bind ourselves in. The only reason we were able to put those clauses in about gender and trade was because of the fantastic work that my honourable friend did previously to ensure that data was collected. This is the next step, to strengthen the hand of British trade secretaries when they are negotiating around the world, to ensure that we say, yes, we want free and fair and open trade, but we want trade also that levels up, not levels down. I mean, levelling up is uh, a word that the other side understand, but I'm not sure a concept that they have managed to deliver on. So, understandably, they would struggle with it in international treaties. But this bill starts to build on that process. But we also only need to look at the real problems that we have seen with shady contracts um, in this government. And we need public procurement reform. I don't believe that the bill does that well, or uh, the, 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 the bill that passed did act. that, the act, act, sorry, the act did that successfully enough. And this is, I'm afraid, having to fix some of those pieces. I'm delighted the government have agreed to meet um, with my honourable friend. And I know that Labour, when in government, will start to fix some of the messes that this government has led us down. Thank you. Janet David. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the aim of this private member's bills, which is more commonly known as the Buy British Bill. They have been put forward by the Honourable Member, my Honourable Friend, for Rotherham. The reason the bill is here is because the Conservative Government has failed to properly reform the procurement system. They have failed to support British businesses. This means they have failed bringing well-paid jobs to communities up and down our country. The British Chamber of Commerce found that in 2021, small and mid-sized enterprises were receiving a relatively smaller amount of direct government procurement money compared to five years previously. I would therefore like to ask the Minister why SMEs are being sidelined from access to public procurement under this government and why they prefer to procure to foreign suppliers, because this is how it seems to me. A Labour government would cut red tape, ensure every small national contract includes an SME at shortlisting and streamline the bidding process. Meanwhile, the Conservatives have failed to use opportunities to reform the procurement progress to support British businesses and communities. The Procurement Act, when it comes into force later this year, will do nothing to address the wasteful approach to emergency contracting rules we saw during the pandemic. This approach saw friends and donors of the Tory party being given the first bite of the cherry, while decent, skilled local businesses are denied the same opportunities. One of these donors is Frank Hester. As we know, Frank Hester was abusive, racist and misogynistic. Even more shockingly, he spoke about ending an MP's life, and I take this incredibly seriously. He is also the sole director of the Phoenix Partnership, an IT company which has been paid nearly half a billion by central and local government and the NHS since 2016. I would like the Minister to reflect on this because the government has to change course. <coughs> Turning specifically to the bill and on food, uh, British food procurement, the government's own food strategy for nearly two years ago stated public sector food should be healthier more sustainable and provided by a diverse range of local suppliers, locally procured food waste, uh, locally produced food with reduced distance between farm and fork can provide societal benefits. I would like the government to put these words into action and I wholeheartedly support my honourable friend from Rotherham's bill. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very grateful, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. First, I'd like to thank 
the Honourable Member for Rotherham for bringing this bill forward. I know that she's worked incredibly hard on this and she's done an enormous work, amount of work consulting with a wide range of stakeholders on the need and the scope of this bill. In Newham, adding value to procurement decisions is seen as a priority. But it's been made extremely difficult, as I'm sure you'll all appreciate, with 14 years of austerity, which has left Newham Council reeling while massively increasing local need. The real impact of funding cuts is hard to quantify because each cut has a social and economic impact. But with Newham's general fund being cut by around 18 per cent and our population increasing by 16 per cent. Wow. Of course, we can't fix all of this through <coughs> procurement, but we can address some of it by community wealth building as part of long term. And I want to be really honest about this. It is a really difficult thing to achieve, but that's what the council's working towards. And frankly, I believe they deserve our full support. Yeah, yeah. Like many councils from Manchester to Darlington, Newham has gone further. It has decided to focus on the many ways that we can build a community's wealth. To me, community wealth is about creating a resilient and inclusive economy for the benefit of the local area. And that means harnessing the economic and the social power of locally rooted institutions, including our councils, schools, police, universities, health boards and housing associations. And one of the ways that Newham Council is building community wealth is through increasing the proportion of its local procurement spend. Yeah. Newham Council has also provided support to local businesses so that they can easily, more easily, uh, reply to their tenders. A few years ago, Newham had a significantly lower pro proportion of resilient businesses than some other areas of inner London. Only 48% of businesses in Newham were assessed as resilient in 2018, compared to 69% in inner London as a whole. For some of these businesses, being awarded longer-term local contracts doesn't only help them survive, it helps them to thrive and to grow in a sustainable way. In the Royal Docks, the Council has worked with partners to create London's first living wage zone, with every single employer encouraged to pay the London living wage of 13 15 an hour. More than 100 local employers have signed up to the Council's voluntary community wealth building pledge, and that pledge includes a commitment to pay the London living wage. The pledge also includes a wide range of steps that the Council encourages employers to do to help to build community wealth. For example, by buying local, by prioritising sustainability and supporting local residents. These include having at least two new uh, suppliers within their existing supply chain or committing to seek out quotes from new and businesses when procuring new services and products. They also pledge to reduce their carbon footprint. Businesses can switch to, are encouraged to switch to a renewable energy provider or to implement a scheme to encourage their staff to cycle or get public transport to work. They're encouraged to invest in staff and young people. Businesses can create lots of opportunities from Newham's massively talented young people through apprenticeships, and this is something that the Council seeks to encourage. And businesses that sign up to the pledge can choose to be linked to the Council's Newham Work Service to make it easier to hire local people. Businesses can also choose to be linked up with local voluntary projects that need their support. And all this means that businesses and employers become more invested in and embedded in our community. Equally, this emphasis on community wealth building has to involve connecting good local businesses with one another, supporting networks and harnessing the creativity of our small business leaders. Because we all know that local government officers don't have all the answers for how the local economy and society can prosper. 
For most participants, the pledge is obviously voluntary, and the role of the Council is to encourage and support good practice, not to impose it. And for businesses, there is a clear benefit in terms of their reputation, as well as having a more secure network of partners around them. Ultimately, we should see procurement for social value as one component in a larger strategy of shaping the local economy so that the prosperity we create is more widely shared and better sustained over time. But when it comes to procurement itself, the Council has a commitment to use its processes to ensure that contractors, as well as the Council itself, pay the London living wage in full. There's clearly, that's clearly of massive importance, given the continuing impacts locally of the cost of living crisis. I think all of us here today can understand that when our local areas have thriving businesses, that means better jobs for our communities, it means higher standards of living, and we all want that. New York Council recognises the value of smaller local businesses and the value of good employment standards. And surely that's the kind of encouragement and offer of partnership we should be giving to entrepreneurs and business people across the UK. Let me give one last example. Populo is Newham Council's wholly owned housing company. They're building homes for rent, including a significant proportion of genuinely affordable homes in order to tackle the housing shortage, which is impoverishing so many people in Newham. They're currently building hundreds of new homes in Newham, aiming for 7,000 by 2040. By being wholly owned by the Council, they can embed higher standards in procurement, planning and design, so that our wider social and economic goals are met, as well as delivering more of the homes that are so ne desperately needed locally. I have much more that I could say on this subject, Mr <laughs> Deputy Speaker, but I want to give my colleague from the front bench her opportunity to speak as well. Yeah. Yeah. Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I'd like to begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the Member for Rotherham, for her success in the ballot for private members' bills and for choosing to bring forward a bill which could benefit not only the small and medium-sized <coughs> enterprises in her own area, but those right across the UK. The Honourable Member has long recognised the importance and huge contribution of small and medium-sized businesses in her area and has stood up for them, as well as campaigning rigorously for the steel industry. She has put considerable effort into preparing this bill, including setting up a working group with a whole range of organisations, including the TUC, Rolls-Royce, UK Steel, the National Farmers' Union, the National Federation of Builders, the RSPCA, Countryside Alliance, Broom Procurement Services, YPO, and the Association for Public Service Excellence. And I would like to congratulate her on an excellent speech, but which did reveal some shocking facts of how time after time, medium, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises are missing out to foreign suppliers or to big multinationals who are manufacturing abroad. Whether it's naval ships or whether it's construction, uh, there's such a range of industries which are missing out. And I'd, thank, I'd like to thank the members for Brighton, Kemp Town, West Ham and Darlington for their contributions as well today. Now, the UK is a party to the World Trade Organization's Government Procurement Agreement and other international free trade agreements, which, for procurements <coughs> over a certain value threshold, legally require contracting authorities not to discriminate against suppliers from other countries who are also signed up to one of those agreements. Nevertheless, Procurement policy can still do plenty to support British businesses, such as, for example, by using stretching social, environmental and labour clauses in contract design to ensure that British businesses are recognised for the very high standards that they meet. Now, as has been mentioned earlier today, may, people may well ask, why is it that my honourable friend is bringing forward a bill on procurement when only last year the Government brought forward its own procurement bill, which will be coming into force this October. Well, quite simply, the fact of the matter is that the Government's Procure Procurement Act was a wasted opportunity to reform procurement, and in spite of our attempts to strengthen and improve the bill with our amendments, 
Unfortunately, the Procurement Act, when it comes into force in October this year, will allow the same wasteful approach to emergency contracting rules that we saw during the pandemic, with friends and donors of the Tory party being given the first bite of the cherry, whilst decent, skilled local businesses are denied the same opportunity. Billions of pounds of public money wasted, which excellent small and medium-sized businesses like the like, uh, like B 